This holy city behind me is like no other city on earth. But why? Next on The Prophetic Connection. This place, the Mount of Olives, very near. Fulfilling the prophecy, waiting for the day when the Messiah will come. Jerusalem is like no other city on earth, and the answer is straightforward. It's the only place on earth God said he would put his name. 3,000 years ago, King Solomon dedicated the first temple to the glory of God, and God spoke to him, and it's recorded in 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse 3. And God said, I will put my name here forever. And we know from other scriptures that God's eyes are on the Temple Mount and Jerusalem day and night, perpetually. And yet, for 2,000 of those nearly 3,000 years, this city lay in pretty much desolation. Yes, empires clashed over it, but no empire ever chose Jerusalem as its capital city. It is and always has been the capital of only one nation, and that nation is Israel. And it would be nice to think that as Jerusalem basks in the morning sun, and actually it's Shabbat today, so in some sense it's tranquil and people are honoring the fourth commandment. They're remembering the Sabbath to keep it holy. And so it is peaceful today, but according to the prophetic scriptures, the days that lie ahead will be turbulent for the holy city. Listen to the words of the prophet Zechariah in chapter 12. Here's what he says of Jerusalem's future as I stand here on this quiet morning. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel, thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Now, that's happened numerous times down through history. But when we go to Zechariah chapter 14, we have even more detail because we're told the Messiah will come to the Mount of Olives. But he comes because the armies once again have surrounded Jerusalem and another battle takes place. That battle is yet to come. Throughout scripture, it is clear that Jerusalem is important to God. But what makes Jerusalem so special? God says, I have placed my name in Jerusalem forever. So God's whole identity is wrapped up with this city. So really, the significance of Jerusalem is that God has set it apart, made it a sacred place. It's the holy city. That's even spoken of in the New Testament. Jerusalem is the only city in the world and in world history where God himself said, that's my city. That's where I will have my name forever. Jerusalem is a part of the testimony of God himself. And it's the city that he chose, the city that he built, the city where he has reigned uh, from the beginning and uh, where he will reign forever. And that's what makes it special. It's special to God. Some have said it's the navel of the world. It's the center of the world, uh, the center of the center. And uh, I tend to agree. If you, if you understand the heart of God, and that God has purposes on our planet, then Jerusalem has to always be at the center of that. Why did ancient empires, or modern nations for that matter, want Jerusalem in the first place? Well, it seems strange that empires would clash over it because yes, Israel is on the trade route, but you don't have to come up to Jerusalem per se. You can go around it, so it's not, you don't have to control the city itself. But there's something that spiritually draws people in from the Romans uh, to the rebellion with Bar Kokhba after Jerusalem had already fell to the Romans earlier, to the uh, Byzantine period where the Byzantines really wanted to control Jerusalem. The Muslims wanted to control Jerusalem because even though it wasn't their holy city, 
the idea of controlling it showed the domination of their religion. So there's something about the idea of if you, if you control Jerusalem, then you prove that you are the dominating political and religious power in the world. It is the spiritual significance of what that city means to the redemption of the world, that the word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. Uh, and that's it, you know, it's just the opposition of the enemy to its destiny. Could Jerusalem be divided yet again? Is this even a possibility in today's modern times? In the original uh, two-state solution from the 48 uh, period, 47, 48, Jerusalem was not meant to be divided into an Arab city and a Jewish city. There was the Arab quarter, and a lot of it hadn't been built out yet. But there were already major Jewish settlements in East Jerusalem. You had the Jewish quarter in the old city. You had Mount Scopus where Hebrew University was. You had Hadassah Hospital already there on Mount Scopus. There were Jewish settlements uh, in, in that part of Jerusalem. And Jewish people lost those uh, places of residence in the 48 war and then brought them back. What, what the world wanted to do was to internationalize the city and then it could be a place for both Jewish and Palestinian capitals, but still a unified city under international rule. The city is so integrated now with metros. Where, where would you put the wires to separate it? Would you put it between the old city, the Jewish quarter and the Arab quarter and the Christian quarter? How, how would you even begin to divide it? One could perhaps see a united uh, city with institutions for both sides, some going toward the Palestinians and some going to Israel. I don't think that's going to happen, but to divide the city? The metro runs from the east side of the city to the west side of the city. What, are you going to stop the metro there? I mean, I just don't see it as possible. How does the average Israeli or Jew feel about Jerusalem today? Jerusalem is God's throne on earth, and the Jewish people returning to Jerusalem is living proof of the living God of Israel. And those who stand against the God of Israel obviously don't want to see the Jewish people returning to our eternal capital. And they'll make up all kinds of reasons and excuses and political reasonings of why the city must be divided and why the Temple Mount must not be ours. But ultimately, if there's ever been a proof of the existence of God, we would look at the Jewish return to the land of Israel after 2,000 years, like all of the prophets spoke of, and our return to our capital, Jerusalem. And Zechariah says that when we return to the land, the nations will come and Jerusalem will come a burden for the whole world, that the world then has to come to grips what God exists, meaning I can't do whatever I want. I actually have to listen to that good book and be moral and good. I can't just be a monkey. I can't just be an animal. I have to be a human. I don't want to be a human. I don't want to be created in the image of God and I have to be a godly person. I want no responsibility. And so our presence in Jerusalem is proof of the Bible's validity. It's the proof of God's sovereignty. And those that don't want God's sovereignty in the land of Israel will oppose it. And so Jerusalem is much more than a political reality. It is the ultimate spiritual reality. And Jewish presence in our eternal capital is living proof that God is alive and well, guiding history and guiding us towards redemption. While there have been many clashes over Jerusalem in the past, the Bible makes it clear that there are more clashes to come. We can be sure, however, that the sovereign God who watches over Jerusalem day and night will still be in control of Jerusalem's destiny after the guns of war fall silent and the dust of battle settles as before. Don't go away. After this short break, Dr. John Twee returns with his teaching. The astonishing thing about this beautiful city that you can see behind me is that for nearly 2,000 years it lay lonely and neglected. Following the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Roman army in AD 70. And this continued really right up until 1948 uh, and in a sense even beyond that until 1967 when the Israeli army in six days of war in June of that year captured the eastern part of Jerusalem as well. But for those almost 2,000 years, the city just 
seem to be neglected. And it was certainly true um, under the Ottoman Empire and the Turkish Empire. The Ottoman Empire controlled Jerusalem, occupied it, in fact, from about 1515 to 1917. But that all ended with the arrival of the British Army that came up through the desert, um, having taken uh, Beersheba and then Gaza in turn, and then they marched north. In fact, they were an allied army um, under General Allenby, a British general who incidentally was a believing Christian. His army marched up this valley behind me, and if you see the walls over my left shoulder, they sort of surround the Jaffa Gate. And when General Allenby, it, tradition says, came to this gate, uh, on his horse, he dismounted and walked in. And according to the tradition, he said he did that because there was only one who was, had the righteousness to enter the gate on the horse. He was thinking of the Messiah that is to come, Jesus of Nazareth, the one that he believed in. Now, today the city is prospering, and over my left shoulder, the ancient city, over my right, the prospering modern city of Jerusalem, the past, the present, coexisting, and would that the future could be just as bright. But according to the prophecies, it is not so, at least in the first phase of the unfolding of these prophecies. And so let me walk you through two major prophets from the Old Testament period, and then we'll move into the things that Jesus said. So in Joel chapter three, and Joel had tremendous insight. He wrote, he prophesied and wrote about the day of the Lord, the final culmination of, of biblical history. And in Joel chapter three, we read these words, for behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, and of course they're back, the Jews are back in the land after 1878 years of exile among the nations. And that's, those, that's the time period between 8070, when the Romans destroyed the city, and 1948, when Israel was reestablished as a nation, and we might even say reborn as a nation once again. So they're back. And then Joel says, but after that, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, Jerusalem is surrounded on three sides by valleys, but Jehoshaphat means valley of judgment. So really, the nations are gonna be judged around the valleys of Jerusalem. And certainly this valley of Jehoshaphat, uh, the valley of judgment. And God says, I will enter into judgment with them there. Why does God do this? Joel says, on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. Now, there is talk of further division of the land of Israel. There's even talk of the division of Jerusalem. And we can see from the scriptures that that's not God's heart. That's not what God wants for this holy city. This city means peace and this, you can't have peace if you have a divided situation. So we know from the scriptures that God desires peace for Jerusalem. There's more. On the lips of the prophet Zechariah, and we've been in these scriptures before, but he says in chapter 12 in verse three, this day is coming and I will make, in fact, verse two, behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. You know, when the city was uh, lying in sackcloth and ashes, nobody was really interested in it. But now it's become the jewel of the Middle East. It's prospering under the hand of Almighty God. And now the nations are very much interested in it because it's the capital of a Jewish nation. And many nations don't want a Jewish nation to exist. And they don't want the Jewish nation to have this glorious Jewish capital. And, so, and beyond that, the powers of darkness at work trying to steal away from the Jewish people what God gave them. And so we have this, that this, na this city of all the cities in the earth is going to become a stumbling block to the nations. Now, when will that happen? Well, it's happening today, but the battle for Jerusalem that's going to take place is described for us in Zechariah chapter 14 in the first verses. And we've seen this as well. And that's when the nations surround Jerusalem once again. 
and Jerusalem is on the point of absolute defeat. But then the Messiah intervenes, and we're told in Zechariah 14 that his feet touch the Mount of Olives, there's an earthquake, and that's when the real final battle begins. It will probably rage from here in Jerusalem all the way up to the Valley of Armageddon uh, in the north, um, in the Galilee. And it will be a, a battle fought by um, large armies, but they will be fighting against the armies of heaven and the angels of Almighty God and the saints that Christ the King of Kings will bring with him. Now, I want to share another scripture about the destruction of Jerusalem because, and it's not something we really want to consider because look at this beautiful jewel in the crown uh, that has been raised up out of the ashes of so much suffering. And then we read in Luke 21, in the signs that Jesus gave, and in verse 20, here's what he said. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that the desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea, meaning the area around Jerusalem, flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. Why? In a sense, because devastation is about to fall yet again. For these are the days of vengeance, the vengeance of our God, that's what that means, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. The words of Joel, the words of Zechariah, the words of the other prophets, the words of Jesus. But woe to those who are pregnant and for those who are nursing babies in those days, because a, a mother with child can't move very quickly, obviously. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles on the time, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And this raises the question, well, when will the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled? You know, today we have uh, two mosques of Islam on the Temple Mount. So there is no Jewish temple there, so we would have to say that the times of the Gentiles, non-Jews, continues as before. But Jesus had more to say. In fact, Luke records things in his gospel account that Matthew doesn't. And so when we put the two gospel writers together, we get a composite picture of all the things that Jesus said. We, we can get a panoramic view of the future according to the signs Jesus gave. And listen to this incredible statement uh, on the lips of Luke, the gospel writer, in verse 25 of Luke 21. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. Now, Joel writes about blood moons, and we have um, just come through a series of blood moons. And are the heavens speaking to us? There's been a lot of speculation about what these signs mean. The interesting thing is they've occurred in conjunction with Jewish festivals, feasts, Passover and Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. And so when we measure blood moons against history, we see that very significant things have occurred where Israel is concerned when the blood moon occurs in conjunction with Jewish feasts. So God may be, in fact, God said to us, there'll be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. And the question is, are we reading these signs correctly? This is, this next, next statement, we, we can identify more readily, we can understand it more easily. And on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and waves roaring. And we're having tsunamis that cause incredible devastation. Now they talk about the El Nino effect that changes our weather patterns, but something is happening with the weather of the world. Is that an interpretation of what is said here? The sea and the waves roaring? Then this, men's hearts filling them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, the world is in turmoil today. There is distress of nations, there are wars, but then this word, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. So Jesus is saying the signs devastating though they may be are in fact the means of hope. When these things begin to happen, 
we can look up because we know the coming of the Son of Man, the Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, his coming is closer than ever before. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So while Jesus gives these signs of the times, uh, he tells us there'll be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth, the stress of nations, the sea, and the waves roaring. These in themselves are reason to hope because they are um, harbingers of his coming, signposts on the sands of time, and all that has taken place that the Lord is about to come. And why does he come? What will bring his coming? The final battle over Jerusalem. When specifically will the battle take place? I'll answer the question after this short break. Don't go away. There's more from Dr. John Tweedy after this short break. When the question is asked, when will the final battle over Jerusalem begin? We have the answers in the scriptures, at least we have the clues. They're found in the signs of the times Jesus gave. They're recorded in Matthew 24. Now, over my left shoulder, you can see in the distance, a uh, very tall tower, that is the Mount of Olives. According to the prophet Zechariah in chapter 14, when the Messiah comes, his feet touch that mountain and an earthquake occurs and the mountain splits in two. But that Mount of Olives is also important for many other reasons. Jesus spent much time there. And when he gave the signs of the times about the end of uh, the age and the final battles that would take place, and certainly that included the battle over Jerusalem, um, in Matthew 24, we, we find that his disciples are intrigued when he says, he gives them the signs and then they say to him, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And then in Matthew 24 and verse three, we read that now as he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And some are over there, perhaps near the Garden of Gethsemane, we're not told, but definitely on the Mount of Olives. Jesus answered their question. It's recorded in Matthew 24, but look in his account. He has a parallel account in Luke chapter 21. And so we have the story of the wars and the rumors of wars, things that are happening today. Famines, pestilences, nations rising against nations, earthquakes in many different places. But this is just the beginning of the time of the end, the time of trouble. Now, when we go to Luke's account, we find other references. And in fact, in Luke 21, in verse 29, remember this is a parallel account, another part of the answer Jesus gave his disciples. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they're already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. That simply means his return. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. 